it felt great to perform on stage for people that you don't know and for them to like what you did. It makes you feel good inside. I just love the people and love that they came. Today, you can turn on the TV and watch hours of drag performances, but it was not too long ago that a drag performer named Sir Lady Java had to fight the law just so she could perform as her true self. Sir Lady Java is a Black woman. She was a comedian, a dancer, a performer. Hold it over, Mike. Let me in. I was a dancer, and I loved dancing. They could see it in my face. And I wore a little bitty skinny, scanty bikini. It was so little. And for those days, that was the littlest bikini I'd ever seen. Throughout the 60s, Sir Lady Java rose to prominence in the LA nightlife scene, and as a result, uh, began to be tracked by the Los Angeles Police Department for violating rule number nine, which prohibited nightlife venues from employing performers who performed as the opposite gender to the one that they were assigned at birth. Not only was it discriminatory on its face, but it was also applied in a discriminatory manner because there were a number of bars that featured white entertainers and catered to a mostly white or mixed audience uh, that were allowed to perform. But in Black-owned clubs catering to mostly Black audiences with Black performers, it's like that's where the enforcement of Rule 9 seems to have taken place. And so in October 1967, this um, surveillance of her reaches a fever pitch when she's playing a series of shows at the Red Fox, a Black-owned bar on the west side. Despite applying for a permit to be able to employ Java, that permit was denied, and so the Red Fox receives uh, an injunction for continuing to employ Java. And so he didn't renew her contract. And she was saying, like, what? Like, this is just straight up employment discrimination. It's like, this is just who I am. It's just like, I'm an entertainer who happens to be trans. I'm not doing anything on stage that I'm not doing off stage. And that became the basis of her very successful protest. Java responded by working with the ACLU to try to overturn rule number nine. The California State Supreme Court ultimately decided that the entertainer uh, did not have standing to sue, uh, that it was the club owner who had standing to sue. While the court won't hear the lawsuit because uh, the ACLU could not find a bar owner who wanted to be the named plaintiff, Java continues to fight against and flout rule number nine by testing the threshold of properly gendered attire. At the time, in order to be considered properly attired in the eyes of the police, you had to be wearing at least three articles of clothing of the gender you were assigned at birth. Can you imagine coming out in a sequin gown with a bikini underneath, wearing a men's wristwatch, a men's bow tie, and socks? I just see this as the example of like black, queer, and trans like ingenuity and resilience. I think the significance of Lady Java's court case, uh, even though it in and of itself wasn't successful. It laid the groundwork for uh, successful challenges of uh, employment discrimination. And I think this is really important for today because I think of, you know, this was an unprecedented year for the passage of bills and laws that target transgender people. A record number of bills to limit transgender rights. Transgender athlete bans introduced in 31 states. Arkansas passing a bill blocking gender affirming care for trans youth. I think it's interesting, especially the laws that are trying to limit health care, do exactly the same thing. They target trans people, but they aren't the subject of the law, right? The law is for the doctor. The physician is prohibited from. The parents will be held responsible if. And I feel like this is another way that like Java's story and the unfinishedness of it has 
a lot to do with what we're facing today in terms of like the unfinished work around trans people's right to live, to exist. Sugary sweet infection, bad for your teeth. I think it's really ironic that drag and cross-dressing and gender expression was policed, literally policed by the police as heavily as it was back in the day. Because t these days we see that drag as an expression, um, as a, a, a means of performance, um, even for some as, a, as an identity, is celebrated. And that's really because uh, mainstream, cisgender, heterosexual, white culture has figured out how to sell it and make money off of it. Historically, though, one important piece that's often missed is that drag for some, beyond being a career, beyond being sort of an artistic expression, can be the only way that they can access the um, gender expression that they desperately need. I know that that's what it was for me um, in a time when I wasn't going to be celebrated for being trans, where I wasn't going to be celebrated for sort of, quote, living my truth. I knew that I could at least get some applause and maybe even some money <laughs> just putting on a wig and strutting my stuff the way that I wanted to. It relieves something that keeps to be binding you down. It relieves that tension. You can be you. And being you is the most important thing that we have. If you can't be yourself, who can you be?